Same time. This is perfect. So let's. Uh, what did the white guy that is buried here did wrong? <laughs> no, he um, he had a wonderful life. Actually, he he um, was uh, entirely white. You know, by by the standards of the time. I've, I mean, it's getting harder and harder to use that word. It's so ridiculous. But um, anyway, he was the son of a young um, society girl here in Wilmington. Um, it's, it's known which family she belonged to, but I won't say it because I don't think they like it. But um, she had a one-night stand with a French uh, captain, you know, who'd come in on one of the French um, boats. Or who knows, maybe he was there a month and they had a, an affair or whatever. But she had this baby, this illegitimate baby. She gave it to an enslaved family to raise. So this this man, whose name was David Elias Sajwar, he grows up uh, in a black family and, and living as a black man, sort of, socially. His, his, his granddaughter later said he was was neither slave nor free, neither white nor black. He, he had this ambiguous status. But he married, um, he married a black woman and, um, and, and lived, they, they lived as a black family from that point on, as a family of color, you know. So he's buried here with his, with his people. And doubtless there are other stories like that that we'll never know. I mean, when did he, what period did he live in? Um, he lived in the uh, mid 19th century let's see Carrie's father was born he, you know he was I think maybe born around 1830 40 something like that, Is that when, right, you, Joel? that makes sense. Yeah. when you say that you don't want to uh, uh, mention the name of the family because they might not like it um, what's what's going on in this country that you still <laughs> have to you know um, it's like well in this case it, it's it's the fact that um, I know it through a personal connection, so oh. I don't want to violate that by me. But um, but it's interesting that you show that respect uh, when 200 years have passed yeah. of somebody uh, having I know, an affair. I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But, but I just but it's the interracial reality that it led to. I think that they're probably most uncomfortable with. And I and, and the person who told me, I'm sure, would be totally fine with it being left out but she's she's looking out for the feelings of like her aunt or her grandmother yeah. you know what I mean it's like a whole um, what is the race situation today here oh it's pretty messed up um, you know the, the, the black prosperity that existed here and political culture and intellectual culture and um, the, the the thing that made Wilmington um uh, well, um, you know, some people referred to it as um, a, a kind of black mecca, you know. We have to be a little careful with that because most of the people saying that were white supremacists who were trying to scare people by saying, this is becoming a black mecca, they're, gonna, they're all going to come here. You know? oh. But there were also reasonable people who, who called it that because... Um, it had this culture that was sustained by the waterfront, you know, the jobs created there, and, and they were jobs that it was, it was, you know, assumed that black men had a kind of expertise with those tasks that had been handed down, you know, for a couple of centuries at that point, you know, um, black watermen, there's a great book called The Watermen's Song by David Soselsky, if you can find it. Black watermen had these skills um, from Africa where they'd done a lot of fishing in small boats on tidal creeks, and um, they just knew how to do a lot of this stuff that didn't come naturally to the Europeans. And, and so, for instance, they were relied on um, in the early days of rice culture. The, the, the Africans kind of taught them how to grow rice and then were used as slaves to grow the rice, you know. Which I, which I mention only because uh, 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 the watermen. So they were, you know, they were great pilots. They were great um, uh, uh, in, in ballast boats, which were the small boats that would 
collect the ballast, the rocks that ships use to hold themselves down, um, rope makers, you know, things like that. And, and that, on the basis of that, black people in Wilmington, both enslaved and, and free black, because there was a large free black community here, um, which is the thing that's hard to get your head around, but that's, that has its own history. But there was this community here, and on the basis of that economic, like, you know, consistency of the waterfront over generations, they're able to save money and, um, and, and you know, buy property in some cases. And they, um, they uh, start to generate sons who are carpenters, you know, um, and, and they're, and, and it becomes, it becomes a thriving black middle class. That's what you have here is this, is this burgeoning black middle class, and that's what 1898 seeks to shut down because it's a, it's a dangerous thing. You know, it's part of the fusion. Isn't that what happened in Texas too with that massacre on the... Um... Tulsa, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Tulsa's Tulsa all full. Tulsa, yeah. But uh, um, in some ways, maybe that's one of the most meaningful ways to understand the importance of 1898. If you don't have Wilmington, you don't have Tulsa. This is where the, the, the playbook is established for how you do it, you know. Um, a takeover of a city where black people are doing too well, they're doing well to a degree that is um, um, scaring the whites and, and destabilizing the old, the old order, you know.